Welcome. Uh, my name is Raquel Velez. I am a software developer at NPM Inc. Uh, I'm on the web team. It's really fantastic. We do lots of Node and JavaScript and stuff. Uh, and once upon a time, I used to be a roboticist. Uh, that was pretty cool. So uh, first, I want to get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you like to play with robots? How many of you would like to play more with robots? OK. And uh, how many of you JavaScript? Of you, how many of you Node? OK, excellent. How many of you have heard of Node bots? Good. Spoiler alert, these are Node bots. Uh, they're about two to three years old now. They've been around for a little while. They're totally a thing. And uh, we're going to get into them in a minute. Uh, well, a few minutes. So my goal for today is to first talk about robots, then talk a little bit about Node, and then we'll kind of marry the two and talk about Node bots in general. So let's start off with some basic background. Robotics 101, starting from the beginning. What is a robot? If you ask 10 roboticists, you will get 10 completely different answers. So let's just ask the dictionary. Too many words. OK, so a robot is, for lack of anything else, it is a machine that is programmable by a computer. That's it. That's, it's very, very simple, right? Super basic. It's a machine programmable by a computer. We see them in our homes. We see them in industry. And we're actually already starting to live in the future. This is the 2004 Caltech entry to the DARPA Grand Challenge, which was a, uh, it was a competition to have an autonomous vehicle drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. And uh, nobody actually got very far. But that doesn't matter, because in 2015, this is the Google self-driving car, and it is street legal. So we are living in the future that we all imagined we would hopefully one day be in something, something. Uh, but a lot of people think that getting a job at Google tomorrow to work on these things is completely and totally out of reach, right? How many of you think that this is a job that you want tomorrow but, and that you can get tomorrow? Not very many. Uh, yeah. Why? Why is that? Why is this so hard? Well, it's because robotics is hard. These are some of the problems that we need to solve in robotics before we can really have robots everywhere, right? Things like understanding the layout of a room, or understanding speech, or determining whether or not that is actually a cat in that picture. Or even something as simple as thinking, OK, how do I get from here to the exit door? Because, oh my god, this talk. <laughs> the crux of all of these things is this notion called sensor fusion. And for me, the easiest way to explain sensor fusion is to think of ourselves as robots. You, too, are robots. We have lots of sensors. Right? We have our eyes so we can see. We have our ears so we can hear. We've got these little balance things. We've got touch and taste. And we have all of these streams of information coming in all together. And our brain is parsing it all at once and giving us some sense of state. Right? right now, I can tell you it's a little chilly. That's why I'm wearing a hoodie. And I'm on stage at Strange Loop. And the door is right there. Right? These are the things that I know. My brain does sensor fusion really, really well. But a robot, that's really hard. Really, really, really hard. So more than that, the path to robotics engineering is fraught with danger, right? You need to spend forever in school to get some piece of paper that says, I'm a doctor of philosophy and something that we still don't understand yet do a whole lot of research, publish some papers, and hope to goodness that you can find somebody to give you money. Because let's be honest, these things aren't cheap, right? None of this is cheap. That uh, this Asimo, hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
None of us is going to go out and buy one tomorrow. Although, if you have the check to do that, let me know, and I will happily take some money off of you too. OK. But what if it didn't have to be so hard? What if it didn't have to be this in order to engage with this industry? Keep that in mind. Now we're going to kind of boop to the other side with some Node. So brief overview. Node is JavaScript, but it's on the server because you know we've had JavaScript on the client side for so long. Let's put it on the server too. What could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> but really, the, what's wonderful about Node is this notion of async I/O. And I'm going to get to a little bit more on what async is. But the beauty of async is that you can have lots and lots of, of input and output all at the same time. And things don't go totally awry. And that's kind of awesome, which basically means that you can have lots of real-time applications, lots of people hitting your servers, lots of things happening all the time, super fast, fantastic, oh my god, Node, yes, great, OK. The other thing is that Node has our super, super tiny small core, which allows us to build really anything that we want. And I'll get into that in a second. So the thing that throws most people off is this notion of async. People are like, OK, I'm coming from a synchronous language. Why would I do callbacks? What? That's super weird. Um, I like analogies a lot. So to me, async is like, it's like going to, like understanding async is like going to the mall. You want to buy an outfit, shirt, pants, and shoes. So you go to the, sh the shirt store, and you're like, OK, I found a shirt. I'm going to pay for it, have the shirt in hand, then go to the pants store, do the same thing, shoe store, same thing. But the key is that you have to have an article of clothing before you can move on to the next article of clothing, right? Contrast that. That's sync. That's synchronous I.O., if you want. And then async is like buying something online. So you go to shirtstore.com, pantsstore.com, shoestore.com. You buy all your things. Your shirt may come first, but then your shoes might come next. And then two weeks later, because it got lost in the mail, come your pants. And that's fine. Because it, at that, in that point, you didn't necessarily need to have an article of clothing in hand before you moved on to the next article of clothing to buy it. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of, not really. Look at the picture. Okay. <laughs> the other beauty is this t super tiny core, right? Other languages, they, I love every language, it's totally cool, but some languages, kind of ask you to install everything plus the kitchen sink, which is great, right? Because it basically means that you have everything in your environment that you need to build your application. Node decides to do something totally different. They're like super, super tiny core, just the basics, thank you very much. Anything else you want, go and get it from NPM. So NPM is our package management tool that allows us to share snippets of JavaScript code amongst developers, whatever, fantastic. But it's kind of like building blocks, right? Lego blocks. I want to build whatever I want to build. And for this particular application, which is going to be a web service, I'm going to get something like Express, which is an entire framework. Or for this tiny thing, let's call it, I don't know, a robot, then I can grab a, a framework like Johnny5 and build something off of that. But it's still Node at the core, and we can just build on top of it with these wonderful Lego packages. Cool? Yeah, OK. So let's marry these two things together. Robots. And Node, make Node bots. It's a very happy, wonderful, wonderful thing. So what is a Node bot? A Node, is, a node bot is just a robot programmed with JavaScript. Really basic. And what does that look like? This is the hello world of Node bots. This is for, it's really kind of hilarious. It's super simple. It's just a button that when you press on it, the light turns on. And when you let go of the button, the light turns off. And this sounds really silly, right? You're like, OK, this isn't that exciting. But let me tell you, when you have a group of developers like yourselves, and everybody's trying to do this hello world, people start struggling. And they're like, I don't understand. And then all of a sudden, there's this moment where every single person in the room, one at a time, will go, oh, I am Prometheus. I have brought fire onto the world. <laughs> because this thing turns on, and you're like, yes! I did it! I made hardware blink! <laughs> and then you move on, and you move up onto this 
this thing called the sumo bot. I know it's cute and adorable, but it's actually angry. <laughs> what is the point of sumo bots? The way sumo bots work is you have two sumo bots in a circle. Last one in the circle wins. Again, super simple premise, but imagine looking at a room of developers like yourselves screaming and cheering on these tiny little robots going, go, 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 go. It's hilarious. I recommend you do it at some point. It's really fun. But what's really wonderful is you don't even have to make your own robot. You don't have to actually dabble into the hardware at all. You can get off the shelf components or entire things, right? This is the Parrot AR drone. It's a quadcopter. You can buy one off of Amazon right now, and then you can upload Node to it. And you can use Node to make this thing lift off, spin around, flip, come down, whatever. It's super fun, super exciting, just the best. But I know what you're thinking. You're like, of all the languages that currently exist, why would you choose the one where undefined is not a function? Right? Of all of these incredible languages, this one. But here's the thing. You don't need anyone to write you a piece of paper saying that you know something more than somebody else. You don't need a PhD, you don't need a master's, you don't need any of that. And on top of that, it's completely open source. Every single bit of it, totally open source. So what does this mean? It means that we have a super low barrier to entry here, right? None of this is, like, you don't need anything to get started with this. You could build a Nodebot this afternoon, tomorrow, whenever you get your Arduino, whatever. Nothing else is necessary. Speaking of Arduinos, there are lots and lots of microcontrollers out there, and they don't cost very much. These are the Tesla 2, the Particle Photon, the Arduino Uno. All of them, less than $30 a piece. And they're all open source. So you can hack on them as much as you like, whatever. And if you break one, it's not the end of the world, as opposed to breaking a multi-million dollar self-driving car. That could be the end of the world if you had to self-fund it, just saying. But more importantly, Node. With a robot, what's going on? You're sending commands. You've got sensors, you've got information, you've got data coming in and out and in and out, and you're pushing out to actuators and this back and forth, everything. What does that sound like? That sounds just like Node. Node is kind of exactly the whole point of, of this, right? This is perfect. This is a perfect application for Node. Absolutely perfect. And then on top of that, how many of you remember linear algebra? Just a few. I have some bad news for you. Robotics involves a lot of linear algebra. What if, I didn't, what if I told you you didn't have to actually know all of that linear algebra just to get started with this? Because all of these packages, what's the whole point of these, right? The node ethos is many tiny modules, many tiny packages that do one thing really, really well, and then you build your application with Legos, right? There's a package that does linear algebra for you, so you don't have to, yeah? My favorite thing of all of this is this notion of rapid prototyping. You can break, you can iterate, and you can make something truly unbelievable. Here are a couple of examples. This is the node sash. How does it work? Basically, you tweet at the, at the node sash, and you give it a hashtag color. It's a hex color. And then it just adds it onto the queue, onto the sash. It's really fun because people are just tweeting colors at this thing, and it's just like, whoo, so many different colors. You know, imagine if you had that as like a cummerbund. So cool. This was created by Cass Perch. Cass came to the very first NodeBots event ever, ever, at JSConf US in 2013. She didn't know hardware at all. She was a client-side JavaScript developer, which was, you know, great, fun. Uh, and then she came to this event because why wouldn't you go to an event that's free that allows you to play with robots? I mean, it seems kind of like a no-brainer. But she left totally transformed. She left, and this is one of many, many projects that she makes now. And she spends a lot of time organizing other events, 
she's fantastic. And you can also see this, this light up skirt, which I think glows when you favorite a tweet or something, which is really, really awesome. This is Tharp. Um, it is a hexapod. It's got six legs. And uh, it was created by Donovan Buck. Donovan had also never played with hardware before. He had a, an Arduino that was just kind of sitting, collecting dust. Uh, he, didn't really, he wasn't really interested in learning the Arduino language, which is cool. And uh, he went to an event actually organized by Cass. And he decided, OK, he did the Hello World. That's really cool. And then he decided for his second project, he was going to build this. I don't know why he decided to do that, but all the power to him, OK. The thing is, he needed some pretty hardcore math to do it, which is fine. Uh, he used one of my modules called Vector, which is a robotics-focused linear algebra module. And then he built more on top of it. And I want to show you what this looks like. Uh, creepy trigger warning. This is creepy. <laughs> really creepy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I mention creepy? OK. So why is it so creepy? It's so smooth, right? This is creepily smooth. <laughs> Creeps me out. <laughs> but why is it so smooth? Why is it so smooth? It's smooth because Donovan had the brilliant idea of combining JavaScript animations with robotics. And so he's actually using a browser to animate these legs and then transcoding it over to this robot. And that's why it's so smooth. The things that you can do is just amazing. OK, that's just too creepy. Okay. There's this uh, old saying in the Node community, jiff a sniff. Uh, JavaScript is fun uh, because Node is fun. And uh, so I, I decided to totally take it over and change it up a little bit. But JavaScript is fun, and so Node bots are fun. And we could end this talk right now, and this, I think, would be enough. But there's a little bit more. OK. So no talk is complete. No argument is complete without a counterargument. So there are some downsides. And because this is kind of sad, I have asked the NPM Wombat to kind of join me on this. Uh, so ignore all the sadness. Look at the cute. Excellent. So the first thing is that between abstraction and understanding, there is, that's a trade-off, right? Uh, yesterday, our, our keynote, uh, morning keynote talked about how abstraction can be bad. And I have to agree just a little bit. Not totally, but a little bit. Because the beauty of the Node ethos ecosystem is that there are many tiny modules, which means you don't have to know everything. But it also means that you don't know everything. And so you don't fully understand everything that you're doing with all of these tiny modules. So for example, if you have a bug three modules, three dependencies deep, and you don't understand the linear algebra enough to fix that bug, then you're kind of out of luck. And that really stinks. I don't want anybody to have to stop playing with robots because they don't understand something. So it's on, the onus is then on you to actually fully understand all of the different things eventually. Eventually. But not at first. So that's a good, but yeah. We don't really have a process. I was on a podcast once that asked me, so how do you build a robotics application? And I was just kind of dumbfounded because I don't know. None of us do. This is totally the Wild West. There's no, how do we, how do we, how do we handle errors? How do we test? How do we architect our application in a way that we can have robustness and performance and stability? I don't know. I don't know any of those things. I'm just you know, putting things together and hoping it doesn't blow up. right? I don't want to see the magic smoke. That's my only goal right now. But there is something deeper to be asking here. We don't know what we're doing, which is fine, to a point. And then if we think about how long these things have been around, <laughs> this is super young technology. 
combine that with the fact that robotics is a completely ever-evolving technology, who knows what we're doing? Who knows what's going on? There's a lot of stuff that we still have to figure out. And if we compare it to the ages of kind of similar, similar things, right? Like Node is six years old. Cool, you can play with, you know, whatever, maybe make some spaghetti. Uh, JavaScript is about 20 years old now, can almost drink. And C++ is 32 solid years old, well-established, probably has a gray hair or two. That's fantastic. But when you think about the time to be established, NodeBots is definitely not there yet. We've got a long ways to go before we really can say, we are NodeBots, we are here, we know what we're doing, and we don't. But that's okay. Because I think, ultimately, this is, this is an opportunity in disguise. Despite everything, there's still some good stuff that comes out of this. And if you like this sticker, uh, I have this in sticker form. Come find me. Okay. I want you to consider this. What happens if you give power to people who didn't even know they had that power to begin with? Think about that. You don't even know that you can do something until somebody says, hey, did you know that you could do this the entire time? How do you feel? At first you're like, ugh, that, blah, that's annoying. But then you're like, oh my god, I have power. What can I do? Right? Maniacal evil fingers. But think about this. How long does it take to set up a Ruby environment? Or a C Sharp environment? A Python environment? A C++ environment? How long does it take to set up a JavaScript environment? JavaScript is everywhere. Everywhere. All you need to do to set up your JavaScript environment is open up a browser and open up the dev tools. That's it. Bam, you have JavaScript. You have a dev environment instantly. So whether you have the fanciest, shiniest, newest, top of the line MacBook Pro, whatever, or you're just using the public library down the street, you have JavaScript enabled for you any step of any moment, right? I like to think of getting into engineering as, as a carrot sort of thing, right? I like to give people M&Ms, excite you about fun things to do with engineering, so that by the time you get hit with the stick, it, you are just like, well, but I like the carrot so much, I'm just going to stick with it, <laughs> right? I want you to get into the syntax way, 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 way long after you spent an hour playing with the drone, right? I want you to have fun first. And then say to yourself, OK, there's a bug, two, de two dependencies deep. Why? Let's learn that. OK. Time to play with some demos. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean with all of this fancy stuff. All right. Let's all pray to the demo gods. I sacrificed a sticker earlier today. We'll see what happens. You can't see any of that. That'll work. Does that work? Okay. So I'm going to start off by going to this really fancy website called Localhost. Okay, so this is, this is just going online to this website, and this is a serial manipulator. So what is a serial manipulator? It's basically a bunch of links, uh, or joints, tied together with links, all in a row. And you can move the joints around, the links don't change, but that's okay. And the easiest way to think of a manipulator is to think of the ones that we have attached to our bodies, like this arm. Actually, I'll use this arm because microphones. Okay, so what's going on? We have two joints. We have the shoulder joint, which is linked to the elbow joint. 
which is linked to the end effector. You can call it the claw if you like. I'll call it my hand, but it's really the claw. And there's a really interesting thing that you can do with manipulators, and, and you can study with manipulators. It's called kinematics. Kinematics is just the study of motion, really simple. But in robotics theory, we, we talk about forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. So forward kinematics works like so. If we input our two uh, angles, we can calculate the position of the end effector, right? So if I change this angle, cool, I can see where this is changing. If I change this angle, cool, I can see where the end effector is changing. If I change both, I can always calculate where the end effector is. And this is a one-to-one -one unique solution, right? Any single random whatever set of angles, I will always know where the end effector is. Inverse kinematics is hmm, the inverse. So I have the end effector location as my input. And then I can calculate what my joint angles are instead. So if I have my you know, end effector here, then these are my angles and whatever. But it's a little tricky, too, right? because this is not a unique solution. Because I can have my end effector here, but my joints could actually be here or here. So it's not unique, and therefore it's a little bit more tricky and mm, stuff. Uh, so, but we can see this online. Right? We have our wonderful website, and we can say, uh, oop, not what I wanted to do yet, that's okay. So I can change the first joint, and that's cool, and I can see that. And I can change the second joint, and that's pretty cool, I can see that too. And we can play with inverse kinematics, and you'll, you're going to see what happens. It jumped. Why did it jump? Because it's a non-unique solution, and I've basically close down the, uh, the, the solution set so that we can just kind of maintain some sense of happiness. So that's really cool. Fantastic. Awesome. Anybody can go to this website, assuming I put it up in the cloud, and learn about robotics from this standpoint. But what happens if we decide to go a step further? So, <laughs> all right, so I can move this around, it's going backwards, or not, no, it's good, okay, cool, and, uh, and so I can move the first joint, and I can move the second joint, right? I'm going on a little bit of power here, just because, OK. And then I can play with inverse kinematics as well. And it's not totally working, and that's OK. There's a bug somewhere. Where is it? I don't know. Let's find out, because this is cool. We're not going to find the bug today. <laughs> but what's, what's going on here? I'm going to disconnect that robot. So thank you, robot. You're done. Um, yeah, yeah, you can do that. That's fine. <laughs> Love applause. Just bring it on. That's, that's the best. Uh, so what's, what's really happening here? So let's take a look at some code. Um, so we are, can you see this? Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Uh, so we're requiring some different packages. Uh, what's the difference between a package and a module and node? Not very much. A package is something that you put in NPM. A module is something that you require in your code. That's it. They're essentially the same thing. Uh, tiny differences, whatever. Uh, but this is, this is one module vector, which is for all that linear algebra stuff that we don't want to have to think about. And then we have another module called Johnny5. And Johnny5 is this beautiful language that, or framework, because it's still JavaScript. Uh, it's a beautiful framework created by one of the board members of jQuery. And you'll see how that, why that matters in a second. But what am I doing? I am instantiating my board, and I am instantiating my servos. So what did I do? I just said, OK, I have an upper servo, which is located at pin 9 with this limited range of between 10 and 170 degrees. What is a pin? A pin is just a socket on my microcontroller. 
And they're all conveniently numbered, so I can say, OK, pin 9, that's, where, that's what's happening there. And that's it. I have instantiated my servo, which then means that when I want to use my servo, I can just say servo.2 and then give it a value. And that's it. None of this uh, keeping track of pointers and getting rid of memory because I don't want any memory leaks or whatever. Bam. That's pretty easy. And so all I'm doing, and then there's you know, math. You can ignore this if you want, or you can love it. I choose the latter. Uh, and so I, I have some math happening right now to calculate the forward kinematics and the inverse kinematics at any moment in time. And it's really, really cool. OK. I want to show you how easy it is to turn an LED on and off, because it's the hello world. And I want you all to feel like Prometheus bringing fire to the planet. Uh, can you all see the, well, hopefully you will see a blue light soon. Uh, da, 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 da. So LED, what are we doing? We are requiring Johnny Five. We've instantiated a new board. When the board is ready, we have a new LED. We're instantiating an LED at pin 13, and we're going to strobe it every hundred every hundred milliseconds, right? So it should be blinking a lot. So that's not it. Ignore that one. There. Now it's going nice and fast, right? And then I can change it. Oh, nope. I can make it go a lot slower. Let's go every 800 milliseconds. And so, ignore that. There. Now it's turning on and turning off. Turning on and turning off. We have brought fire via an LED in Hello World, right? This is super, super amazing. Think about it. As somebody who may have never, ever touched hardware before, I didn't have to think about pointers. I didn't have to think about types. I didn't have to think about anything. I just had to think about, OK, what, what pin is it connected to so I can turn it on? And how fast do I want it to strobe? That's powerful, powerful stuff. Okay. Done with demos. That was fun. And so because things didn't work perfectly, here's a nice video. Uh, how does it work? How does this work? Basically, we have JavaScript via Johnny5. or We have JavaScript. And then using Johnny5, that JavaScript gets turned into Fermata which is the language of the Arduino. We've, uh, I've flashed it with standard Fermata, which is just one of the options that you can flash an Arduino with. And I send the Fermata over the serial, over the USB via node serial port, which is another package. It's a dependency of Johnny5. And then there it goes onto the Arduino. And the Fermata there says, OK, you're talking to me in Fermata. I know Fermata. Then it says, OK, you want me to turn this servo, but that's really more of a pulse width, pulse width modulation. So we'll just kind of turn it to just the right thing, and it'll go to that, that measurement. And that's it. Very, very simple. And if you wanted to build one of these, how much is it? It's actually like 50 bucks. Not really that expensive, uh, comparatively. So if you're looking to play more with this, I highly recommend you go to johnny5.io. There's an incredible community behind this. And a lot of people often ask me, OK, well, how do I get started? What, what hardware do we need to buy? Like, How much should I expect to invest? This is about $100, less, less than $100, the ARDX starter kit. I think if you can find one of the remaining Radio Shacks, you might even be able to get it for like $40. Um, <laughs> but it's really great. A lot of, I mean, the components are pretty cheap. And you can feel it, you can, you can figure, you, can, you notice. But at the same time, if you're going to have the blue smoke, let it be with something super cheap that you can replace for you know, cents on the dollar. Uh, start with this, play around, 
magic smoke all you like, lick an LED, or a, a, a nine volt battery, you know, really go all out. And then once you fully understand everything, then go ahead and start buying the really expensive servos and make your super creepy hexapod, whatever you want. Definitely learn more about NodeBots. Such an amazing community. Anybody can be part of it. I mean, you saw some of the projects that have come out of people starting things for the very, very first time. It's really, really incredible. So what's next? I've shown you what's possible. Hopefully, I entertained you at least a little bit. And, and now you know a little bit more about NodeBots and the community and what they're working on. But if there's one thing, one thing that you leave here with, it's I want you to, to leave with the understanding that JavaScript and robots is probably the silliest idea ever invented. But if our goal as technologists is to build a better internet and to bring more people to the forefront of technology, no matter where they are, whether they're at this conference or across the street, then gosh darn it, I really think this is a pretty good starting point. So let's get to work. Thank you very much.